Uh, call the meeting to order at 502. Uh, like the review, I didn't see the date on the review, the last minutes from our meeting. Does somebody have the date on that, Donna? By May chance? 12th. May 12th. May 12th, thank you. Can I get a, a motion and a second on the minutes from May 12th? Motion. Second. second. And we'll do a roll call. Uh, Bill? Yes, sir. Phil? Yes. Damien? Is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Mary? Yes. Keith? Did he leave for a second? Okay. Judy? Yep. Lynn? Hello, Lynn. She was there. Oh, there she was. I know Olivia is there. Hi, Olivia. Hello. Yes. yes. Keith, we can prove in a minute. Yes, Keith. We're doing a roll call for the minutes, okay? Lynn? Yes. Thank you. Uh, is Shelly is Shelly aboard? Oh, there she is. Shelly, uh, financial statement, please. So I emailed out the Frontier statement and then the um, union statement separately. I'm not going to read through all of the warrants and the totals, but we'll get them in the minutes. Um, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. There's not a whole lot to report in funded since we last met. Um, but all warrants for union are being signed electronically. And then uh, Mr. Decker did sign the warrants last week. Um, I think on his last day. So <laughs> that's all set and taken care of. That's an adorable legacy right there. <laughs> I miss him already. No offense to the newcomer taking his spot. Or his former well, spot. Probably we're going to have to come up with a new person who has to sign the warrants, correct, Darius? Okay. Um, we'll come up with somebody who's available. It could be myself or somebody else that's available when, when they're ready to be signed. Um, we have to go in-house, right? Because there's always too many, Shelly, for warrants. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work after, um, you know, six weeks or so or eight weeks of the warrants being done electronically with the union schools. I don't think Frontier is going to work. I think the file is going to be way too large unless we switch to a different uh, platform to do it electronically. Um, but I'm still thinking about that, and and I will be soliciting feedback from the union members as well to see if you know if things are really going as smoothly as we hope that they would. So okay. For now, we'll continue with signing in person. I mean, if if everybody wants, I could I could be the person who wants to sign unless somebody else wants to do it. You know, if somebody wants to volunteer, go ahead. If not, I could do it until we meet together again or whatever so we'll go we're going to jump right in if someone motion to make bob the the signer and someone second it and just voted folks just so you can have that official is that a yes from you phil for a motion yes <clears throat> i'll second that i'll second that you. we'll do a roll call again please we have to do roll call on everything we vote on guys uh bill yep Bill? Yes. Uh, Damien? Yes. Uh, Mary? Yes. Yes. Damien? Oh, Keith? Uh, Judy? Sorry. Yep. yep. Uh, Lynn? Yeah. And Olivia? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to jump right into uh, unfinished business, planning for school opening fall of 2020, and we'll Turn it over to our luscious uh, uh, superintendent, <laughs> Lusherius. I, I try to spit it out, so. Hey, I'm luscious. Hey, um, <laughs> just, so just uh, two little quick points. Um, I do want to, we didn't get a chance to introduce um, uh, Missy Novak, who was elected into the 
um, spot from Deerfield taking Bob Decker. I did have a nice closing exit with Bob and I told him we would invite him back as soon as we're back together to thank him for his years of service and do that appropriately. I, I think we could try to do it online, but it doesn't do the justice of someone who's served as many years as he has for this community. So as soon as we get that back, I, I also ask all of you to remind me, make sure it doesn't fall off our radar that we get him, we invite him back and give him his ado for all his work there. So, so welcome aboard, Missy. And to the, as I met with Missy briefly, I said, you picked a heck of a time to join school committee. <laughs> it's going to be trial by fire. Um, and, I, and I apologize, Missy, for not calling your name on the two votes there. I, I had a list going here, and I, I do apologize. So, but, I figured uh, I wasn't going to break the ranks there. Yeah. You know, I'll have you. I'll have you in on everything else. So Thank sorry. You. Um. All right. So basically, the kind of the meat of the the meat of the the, the meeting here. Um, it's unfinished business, but it's also kind of new business business all at once. Um, I want to talk about what we're doing um, to get ready for reopening um, and, and what does that mean? And so we, we talked a little bit about this in the, in the past at some of the joint you know, in, at some of the joint meetings. This meeting originally was going to be a joint meeting with the elementaries and frontier. Um, I met with the chairs and basically they decided to split it between the elementary and the secondary just because it was going to be too many people and um, it's, it's important to keep the elementary kind of the, the topics are very similar and, and, and frontiers very similar. And we'll talk about the scheduling of meetings moving forward um, a little bit later in this as well. But so basically um, we've created, so opening in the, in the, let me kind of give an overview, opening in the fall is still up in the air what that's going to look like. But we have to start the planning based on what we do know um, and as we get the information throughout the summer. The state is gonna come out with guidance um, I believe the initial guidance is going to come out at the end of this week. Um, they calling it the initial guidance, and then they're going to come back up with late guidance a little bit later on, where they correct everything that kind of explodes um, or goes the wrong way, or they miss you know misinformed. So basically, um, you know they're they're looking at um, and I'm going to open up. I have a little slideshow for you. Let me kind of pull that up. So. Um, Kim McCarthy, Sarah Mitchell, myself, um, and all the principals have created a, um, I'm going to hit present here. Uh, I got to share screen and then go into, hang on, let me share my screen. Never done this and off a presentation like this before. Oh, no, not share. I want to present. Whoops, my bad. All right. Can you guys see all that? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, um, kind of walking through. Go away. Hide. All right. Um, here's our picture of what's learning before the closure happened. We had to do some nice graphics for you guys um, or photos. Um, again, elementary, what it looked like before we were closed. And then we did learning with um, social distancing and events during the spring as we kind of rolled that out. And basically, we started to put some planning together. And so through our planning, um, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, the safety of our community, of course. Um, we also have to create um, adaptive environments for the new regulations that are going to come out um, from the state. I think they're going to you're going to look at reduced class size. They're going to probably look at a models of blended learning, whether people are home and away, um, and then um, making sure that our our outcomes are we have a positive social, emotional, and academic learning outcomes for all students. And so when I bring you into the the meat, I'm going to show you part of the. Uh, um, the planning in a few moments, but you'll see there's a lot of complexity goes into this reopening. Um, so basically, you know, we're looking right now, we're working off the CDC's guidelines of what it takes to reopen, um, which I'm kind of, you can probably barely see here, but you can see in the lower right hand corner, if you want to see this document, go to cdc.gov. It's got a lot of talk about reopening and what we need to consider. The state right now is, is putting together a plan um, that's going to follow the CDC's guidelines it's going to follow some of the other states' guidelines, that, um, stealing it from other 
states that have opened up, like Maryland has a pretty comprehensive plan um, and such. It basically, you know, give us, we were told prescriptive mandates of what we need to put into place in order to open. Um, and I'm not gonna read through the, the uh, CDC stuff, but um, I also shared with you earlier this week, our plan and in those plans are all these links. So if you're interested in any of these links that I'm showing here, they're in that plan for your own for your own research. And so obviously the most important thing is the health and well-being of our students um, and, and faculty. And it's gonna be a it's gonna be a tricky thing to navigate moving forward as we all are talking about um, in our own lives going back to work and going back to some source of normalcy while there's still an unknown out there of whether or not the virus is is re is coming back. Is there gonna be a second wave? You know, you know, are we moving too quickly? Are we moving too slowly? There's all debates happening within our society. Um, and guess what? We're going to be in the middle of it as we talk about what should happen with school. Um, so we're looking at basically, you know, three steps, a combination of three steps, an all-in-person model, a blended model. Um, a blended model can range from, you're probably going to hear a lot of different um, models coming out of a lot of different schools as each school is kind of um, working to figure out what this looks like. But, you know, our students in school for a couple of days and then out of school for a couple of days or in school for a part of the day, then out of a school for a day. There's also you hear the week on, week off models. There's a lot of different ideas being thrown out there. And I'll talk about our committees in a second that are that are going through that. And then the last model is an all remote learning model. Um, you know, obviously that will be the model that'll happen if we have a, uh, a resurgence of the virus and we need to close down. Um, there's also concerns about those who may not be able to come back to, to the school building due to um, compromised immune systems um, and, and such. So we're, we're working through um, what that looks like as well. The state is gonna probably push number two, uh, uh, some sort of blended model um, with different priorities for younger students than for older students. Um, I think you're gonna see that younger students, they're gonna look for having more, more contact um, face to face than the need for older students and such. And so each community is dealing with that in a different way. So we, so what we did, there's a lot of work on the table here. So what we did is we created eight committees. Um, well, number eight committee, by the time we got this thing rolled out, we ended up canceling that committee because we had done already so much of the summer work. So um, that's being worked on by each building. And so the seven committees of overseeing all the work that's gonna to take to come back to school. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna open up the doc in a second here when I'll go through each of these committees and what they're working on, but it kind of basically spells it out what they're doing in each of those committees and I'll, and I'll kind of guide you through that. So, um, so I'll walk you through that document and then um, moving forward, what is your role within this? And so I talked with the chairs, um, basically everything has to be approved. Uh, the overall structure of this has to be approved by school committee. Um, and school committee is quite large. Um, in the sense in our district, as you all know. And some districts are doing where the school committee have an intimate um, involvement in it and they are doing weekly meetings. Um, but we have 25 school committee members, um, different committees of each town representing different districts. And so I propose that we bring forward to you on, I'm proposing these dates, these dates can be uh, modified by the, the by the committee, but um, July 16th, we propose, um, we give you our proposals of possible scenarios for reopening in the fall with the following week voting on the final plans um, of what model we'll move forward with. And so that's kind of how I'm kind of spacing it out. It gives us about a month, <clears throat> a little bit of a month to kind of kind of uh, work through the different, what the groups are coming up with and, um, and then having it bring forward to you where you will kind of get the, your um, approval We'll possibly uh, give you multiple plans. I don't know exactly what the, plan, the committees are going to come out with. Um, and I'll have Sarah Mitchell talk about that in a few seconds um, where where she she sees where the uh, outline might be. But that's how I'm seeing this as a process. And then on, after July 23rd, we would be communicating, you know, out to families exactly what the, the plan is. Um, and there's a lot of work after that goes out. And I'll go, I go into... Uh, I'm going to jump out and go into the um, 
the reopening plan here. This is what I sent out to each of you. Um, it talks about the different here, um, the different committee groups, what they do, and then the, the checklist for each group. So we have a governance group that's you know basically just the um, this, uh, Kim McCarthy, Sarah Mitchell, and myself, just basically we're kind of governing all the groups and making sure everything is falling its line. The groups are working um, successfully, are making progress, making deadlines, and then um, you know helping organize how that's gonna come forward to school committee. We have facilities and safety. Um, obviously this group is gonna work on facility use, the guidelines for all the buildings, um, and how we're going to arrange rooms, how we're gonna clean rooms, how we're gonna keep social distancing within the facilities um, and, and safety um, protocols. Next, we have a, a school operations group. This group is the day-to-day -day, um, operations of the schools. And so I'm gonna, in each of these, and we're just kind of doing an oversight tonight, and you can kind of go into them as you, as you wish. But if you go over here to these links on the right, see, I'll click right here, and I can open up. This is where the meat of this document is. And as you can see, you can see who the uh, who the chairs are, who the member gr groups are from um, teachers and staff members from both middle and um, I mean both high school, middle high, and the elementaries. And then you can just kind of kind of flipping through, you can see all the the work that's ahead. What does transportation look like? Are we going to have to stagger arrival and dismissals? I mean, how do you do social distancing when you're dropping off hundreds of students at once? Or are we dropping off hundreds of students at once? You know, how are we going to use the buildings? How are we going to use each buildings? How are we going to have student movement or teacher movement? And how are we going to do the instruction within each of those buildings? Um, you know, obviously the pattern of traffic, food service. You know, are students going to go to the cafeteria to eat? Are they going to eat their lunch? What about those students who need a uh, free induced lunch and really are depending upon those breakfast and lunch services? How do we get that to them in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a positive way? Um, and you know everything has to go with that then you know covid supplies and i'll talk about that in a little bit um you know what supplies do we need what's the buying schedule you know those kind of things um and then we have to have plans for all those kind of things and then at the bottom you can see like i said this is a living document so this is being updated as everybody's working off of this document so as you're going into it it may change from day to day as you're going to see there you're starting to see summary notes from meetings um, are we are kind of being put in there and such? Um, Sarah, do you want to jump in a little bit and just talk about Sarah's been um, is is a has been a crucial component from the frontier standpoint um, of these committees. I mean, the, uh, uh, George and Scott are also chairing committees, but uh, as kind of an orchestrator of this whole thing. Sarah, so, am I missing anything? Yeah, in the yeah no, there's um, it's it's kind of um, incredible how this is all coming together. Um, it's interesting to watch other districts go through this process also. But in the last two weeks, each of these committees has met um, four or five times and is really starting to scope out exactly what um, needs to happen in the fall, dependent on what comes out with the guidelines. So we're trying to really position ourselves to be able to go in any direction that those guidelines tell us we need to go in. And we're really throwing a lot of things against the wall right now. Um, a couple of the committees had homework assignments for the members to go off and talk with three other faculty members. Uh, we're trying to um, get as much input as we can from faculty. Um, schools ending tomorrow, uh, <laughs> all of this is gonna happen after um, teachers leave um, for the summer. And so we really want to make sure that their voices are heard in this process. Um, we're, we are really working off those three scenarios that Darius talked about. And some of the committees, obviously facilities, is really focused on the in-person scenario or the hybrid scenario um, because we need to get our buildings set up if kids are going to be in school. Whereas the technology committee is really focused on um, the remote learning aspect. Um, obviously, there's going to be some, and the hybrid also, um, there's going to be some technology needs if kids are in all in person, but they're going to be the typical technology needs. Um, for example, um, for technology, we're um, in the process of adopting um, Schoology, uh, which is a learning management platform system. Um, it's similar to Google Classroom but it's quite, quite a few more features that we really feel are gonna be helpful if we end up in a remote learning environment next year at some point. Um, 
we're, Google Meet has been great, um, but you can see just from your own screen some of the, the limitations of it. And so it's got a, um, a much more powerful Zoom type meeting platform that will help particularly younger students if we end up in that situation. Um, you know, curriculum and instruction is planning for what instruction is going to look like. What do we have to make up? What kind of gaps are kids gonna have from having a long period of not having in-person instruction? School operations is talking about um, what does the schedule look like if students are in that hybrid model? Um, you know, as Darius said, is it one week on, one week off? We're looking a lot also at the research behind all of this and what is coming out to be best practices um, in both remote learning and in filling in the gaps. So for example, um, the research says, and this is not gonna shock anyone, that um, bringing back younger children for in-person instruction is gonna be a higher priority. Um, older students might be able to take some, more, some remote learning, um, but we also have concerns. We don't wanna have all our older students um, only in remote learning because that's not going to be good for them. Um, math is the biggest area of loss in remote learning. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, how do we get more in-person math instruction? Um, we can do some social studies in English a little bit easier um, in a remote environment. Um, so there's conversations going all over the place and we're really trying to capture all of that information and get it written down in these documents so that when the state comes out with guidance, um, we can be ready to go in a direction that uh, supports that. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. So D Darius and Sarah, um, so this 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 topic is definitely the thing that I'm stopped around town the most on. Um, and the the one thing that everybody asks um, is, is sort of one thing that I didn't really see directly addressed in your in the bulletins and in the, the and that's the issue of testing, of the COVID testing, and what, you know, parents want to know how often staff are getting tested, um, and staff, and if I'm, a, if I'm a staff member, I want to know how often the kids are getting tested. So, um, and I, you know, so. It's, it's a great question. I'm not, oh, go ahead, if you want to answer, Darius, but, um, you know, and that, that's going to, a lot of this is going to be done for us or done to us. Um, and I think the state is going to be instrumental in providing that type of guidance. Um, Darius, do you have any more information about? Yeah, I mean, I was on a conference this, this, this morning with the superintendent about, you know, being the availability of regular testing when we go back to school, because any child with a fever would be concerned about, you know, whether or not if the child left school with a fever, should they be, you know, screened for COVID, you know, those kind of things, because you're going to have regular illness and you can just see the the, the complexity of this issue once we get reopen things. Um, and so, yeah, one of those questions, will there be regular outside of the, the testing sites that are now, you know, you know, what's the, what's the format going to be for, you know, nurses recommending same as get tested, you know, that kind of thing. And then if there is a positive case, there's gonna be a protocol for that. You know, is it enough that you have to shut down a school or do we shut down a class or, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where a lot of what the, um, what the state is going to be putting out is talking about not mixing students in, in a scrambling in a scrambled bowl all day long. It's going to be keeping them separate for the most part. It's a little bit different at secondary where they're going to allow, I believe they're going to allow some movement because of pres prescriptive classes. Um, but yeah, Phil, it is a, it's going to be one of those things on the radar um, because, you know, we don't have the ability to swab each student as they enter the building. I think Germany did some school opening that way where they were testing every kid weekly. You know, those kind of things. We're also hearing a lot of negative about the, some of the false positives when you don't have symptoms and that kind of thing. So we're going to have to see what they come up with there. So there's a little bit of this um, unknown area there. Are so. we going to have Are we going to have to do like temperature checks on kids when they come into the school? So the we started to prepare for that. We started buying the point at your head thermometers kind of deal, the point and go ones. We got those for all the buildings, at least an initial order. And then they came out and said that there are so many false negatives on um, the, using temperature as an indicator um, that they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be using that as a, uh, a recommendation for schools to use. So, um, so this is the important stuff that's going to come out from the state guidance because they're the ones that are going to say, this is how it has to be set up. 
Um, any pro plan we put together, we have to get approved by the local board of health as well. I met with the local board of health this morning as well before my superintendent meeting. I met with the local board of health and kind of let them know that as well. I said, let us, you know, they could, they you know, obviously they want to be as helpful as possible. I said, well, let us come up with a plan because we're going to be following all these guidelines and then just have you guys look at it at the end. But I have a feeling it's going to probably be an easy check off because we're going to be following the state's guidelines. But, um, you know, Phil, you brought, you know, it's a, good, it's a good question about how we're going to do that. And it's also going to be seeing what's the temperature of the nation, so to speak, within COVID in August. You know what I mean? And then is that going to change as the school year goes on? So we have to be prepared to go to remote learning. Um, that's just a reality, you know, because if there is a second surge or, you know, that kind of thing, um, we have to flip the switch and go back to, um, you know, go back to remote learning possibilities. So all that, and we have to wait and see what the budget comes out for that. And so so we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, so let me just kind of, I just want to talk about the other groups. Um, I'm going to jump right back into um, my screen again. Just I just want to show the last few groups because it's going to answer some of the other questions within it. Um, here. Yeah. Um, you know, Sarah talked about, we do have a, a group just on health and wellness that's, you know, talking about um, exactly what you're talking about there, Phil. You know, um, you know, the needs of every student coming back, the needs of staff coming back, and all the other side issues that come with that. Because there's gonna be a lot of anxiety and, and um, you know, people coming from, um, you know, homes that may have issues with, you know, you know, financially or insecurity of food or, you know, those other kind of things, just making sure that we're re addressing all the needs and mental health issues um, of our community. Because that separation that we've had, you know, it really takes, it takes a hit there. Sarah talked a little bit about the technology and software. We also have a, a family outreach and communication committee. This committee is, um, you know, putting together right now, I just, I just read through the draft, they'll be surveying families um, multiple times during the summer to get their input on certain things. Um, the one going out is going to do a review of how uh, remote learning was this spring. So in case we have to go back to it in the fall, we can um, um, take some feedback there. It's also going to talk about what are your plans in the fall, your initial plans. Um, there's talk right now about a certain number of students who may not be returning. Families may choose to um, see if there's going to be some sort of home, um, you know, some sort of a, a, a home instruction from the school, you know, this continued remote learning. Um, Kind of thing and was the school going to provide something like that in place so those are the things that we have to figure out um, and the same thing we have to know what staff members are going to be coming back so those are going to be other 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 things as well meanwhile in all this we're going to be providing summer supports to those those students who need them um, and that's kind of a mini snapshot of what we have to do for the um, for the fall we're starting with our summer instruction remotely and um, we're hoping to do some in-person um, instruction as it goes on um, so we, we can um, both, as we know, especially vulnerable groups, um, students and IEPs and such, um, they, you know, the in-person in, in instruction is so much more um, effective than the remote instruction. So, um, so, so basically, that's the planning process that we're in the middle of. We hope to have from that um, bring to you by mid-July here are a couple scenarios that it could look like um, and have a discussion. Um, I think the difficulty we have is that we really do need to, even though we're five districts, we do need to act as one to some level because there's the coordination between busing, um, siblings, childcare from families, you know, those kind of things. We have to be talking to each other. Um, we were talking about it at the superintendent's level that districts need to be talking to each other because we have teachers who are, um, I'm looking at the screen, seeing multiple of them, um, who are teachers in other districts, they have children in this district. And, you know, what if we're, you know, what if one other district is going every other week and we're going every other day, which is a terrible mm -hmm. idea, but let's just pretend that's what's happening. Um, you know, how would that affect, you know, childcare and that kind of thing. And so superintendents are worried about that because so many of our teachers have children in each other's districts and that, you know, having some, that would affect, you know, obviously their ability to be working with our students. So we're, we're considering that inside of all the other kind of things we're considering and how we can support those teachers. And then um, what about those teachers with, you know, that maybe have compromised immune systems, 
and, and are unable to return to work, you know, can we find roles for them within this plan? Um, or does their role change to the point where they're going to take other options? So, yeah, so that's kind of, the, you know, what we're going to be coming forward um, in July. Just kind of, you're kind of, there's a space of time here, and I want to be blunt about it. The starting next week, I've asked the administrators to take vacation. Okay, it's been a long stretch. They're burnt out. Um, even if they admit it or not, they'll say they'll keep going. But once we start this, this, this thing rolling again, there's going to be no time for any extended break from mid-July on, even the beginning of July, to, to bring this plan to you and into August. Maybe we get some long weekends. They'll sneak some week, some long weekends in. But they've been going nonstop. Most of them work through spring break, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so whether they want it or not, I've told them I'd like them to take the next, um, next week and the following week off for the most part. It's going to be tough because the state information is going to be coming out and they're going to want to process it. Um, but that's why we're also looking at not um, having the meeting until the second week of July back with meeting with you because I really want to get them that full work week of putting that plan together back with those committees. Our teachers who are also on those committees, they can use a, a breath of fresh air too um, for those two weeks. So that's why there is a pause there. Um, I know I'm talking a mile a minute, so stop me whenever you want. Um, other districts, I, I believe Northampton is going to try to vote theirs by um, end of this month, I think they're looking at the 30th or so. They're a little ahead of us. They're also ahead of us in their planning, but they also have to wait for the state guidance before they can execute their plan. So they're kind of sitting and waiting. They're going to take that state guidance like we would and put it into their plan. Amherst is another one that's a little bit ahead of us. They're looking probably the first week of July, um, probably that first full week of July to do their plan. So us looking into the second week of July. I'm, I'm just comparing us to our neighbors because you're going to read in the paper, like, are we behind? We're a little bit smaller, a little bit more nimble. I think I'm not worried too much about that time frame um, administratively. It's going to still be a lot of work in that last six weeks. Um, and we talk about school calendar in a little bit. We'll see we'll see where the rubber hits the road on that. Um, but that's kind of, that's, you know, one A1 of the planning process of the agenda here. So I guess more questions on what we're doing, how we're doing it, and um, so on and so forth. The administrative team's presentation next week sounds great, but I hope it's not till after Saturday's Conway Town meeting. So we will be at town meeting, Phil, and I'll be at Wheatley meeting on Tuesday. There you during, go. So I'm taking time too. So FYI, uh, right. but uh, you know, not going anywhere because right, you know, good, good, good. yeah, um, maybe maybe Damien will fly me over to Nantucket. Yeah. Right. There you go. Um, so. Uh, the next thing on the, on the list here, Bob, you don't mind if I just keep going, dude. Go ahead. Um, is budget imp implications. So some of this stuff is expensive. And so I just, I'm going to throw a number by you and Shelly's going to shake her head. Don't do it, Darius. You're going to freak them out. But the original PPE list for protections for students working with, I mean, faculty working with students who may be, may require, you know, toileting and, you know, more close conversing, which requires gowns and N95 masks, um, the amount of gloves, and so forth, um, and then masks for uh, available for faculty and students, not one for every day, but just excess and available. Um, and what else is Shelly going to ask you in a second? What else is on that list? But that total for the five districts together for the initial order for the first three months came out to $157,000. That's just in disposable PPEs. And so we're going to tighten that number up and that number is going to come down because that was kind of a, it wasn't the most conservative, it wasn't the most liberal either. It was somewhere in the middle. I think we can tighten it up, um, especially where, you know, we're going to have students probably ask students to provide their own masks. In mask use, you really have to wait for the guidance on that because you're going to see that it's going to be, it's not on all the time, all day long. I know a lot of parents have that fear. Um, tell people to, to wait till that guidance comes out from the state. I met with the commissioner last Friday, uh, me and 400 of my closest superintendents uh, met with him and he kind of gave a an overview that there's going to be a level of recommendation for each age group about when they have to wear the mask and for how long. It's not on all, you're not gonna have second graders wearing that for a six hour day straight with never taking it off. So we're gonna see, so that's gonna be coming out in this guidance in the next couple of days. Um, so that's going to be, um, we're, we're excited to see what that looks like. Um, so 
But when I talk about students providing their own masks, um, I think, especially at the secondary level, I think you're gonna have people wanting that as the new fashion statement. What is, you know, what cool mask do you have? You know, truthfully, I mean, do you wanna wear the surgical mask or do you wanna wear one that's, you know, got your favorite um, cartoon character? I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. The, the, the PPE stuff, that, that's reimbursable to the town 75%, right? So, Shelly, you want to jump on that? I mean, we are going to submit for reimbursement for the municipality, but remember, Frontier has to go to the towns. It's a little bit different than the towns themselves because, Shelly, you want to jump in? Yeah, so we can, we have not submitted um, any PPE product yet um, through the municipal CARES funding. We did put in some funds for each elementary school and the split for Frontier to all of the towns for FY20 purchases, which included um, some technology needs and then some disinfecting, cleaning, sanitizing for buildings. Um, but until we know more about what the state is going to require us to use, it's hard to start planning for PPE needs. And the state is doing what they can to help um, municipalities and districts out. They're trying to put some estimates together with state vendors which would be really helpful because it's going to be such large amount of ordering that um, they're trying to secure vendors that can get us product quickly and get us best pricing and also those on state contracts so that we don't have to put this stuff out to bid because chapter 30b is still going to apply for purchasing requirements right now unless that changes as well so you know we will have some ppe things to submit through the towns and hopefully those uh, applications aren't due prior to knowing what the state requirements are, because that's also a slippery slope too. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that individual schools have to wrestle with this themselves is just embarrassing and shameful. And I'm sorry you guys have to do it, this. It is, um, you're absolutely correct. And we talk about it as superintendents where, you know, the state is like, we're gonna be competing against each other for PPEs in the open market. Um, the state's going to come out with a bid, you know, kind of thing, but it may not be as low as you can get it through private vendors. So they also encourage us to use our vendors. Um, and then, you know, you have, you know, 270 school districts in Massachusetts all trying to get PPEs and freaking out that they will, may not have them by opening day. Um, it, it's, you know, that could be, you know, we, we do have an initial order in. Um, to get some of our, to get some of them, some of it done. We're trying to probably gonna go to multiple vendors to keep price and also that we don't put all our eggs in one basket that a vendor can't fulfill the order. So, I mean, talk about, you know, the complexities of simple things like that. Um, so, and, you know, so we're, we're working, we have the whole committee, you go through the committee, there's a whole committee that's not the whole committee, but um, a lot of their thing is securing PPEs, how much do they have to be, where we're we gonna get them from. Um, in the need there so we may have to, we may have to put sewing back at the high school and start making our own it probably would not be a bad idea it's a new life skill so you're on mask in 30 seconds that's if you know <laughs> my wife has made many of the masks and many of the like bonnets or something for her hair protection and stuff so yeah yep. i'm guessing you didn't buy one of the bonnets I uh, no, no, no. I don't have much up here to protect anyway. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, can, can I ask a question about the curriculum? Go ahead. Uh, did I hear like Schoology? Is, uh, so are we replacing Google Classroom as the, the learning format if we do go online in the fall? Yes. Yes. <laughs> go ahead, Sarah, if you're the kind of the lead on that. Yeah, guy. that's a short answer. Yeah. So, um, so we we have used uh, Google Classroom um, successfully, and Google Classroom works really well in a classroom when you've got a teacher there. Um, it's a great learning management system, but when you go remote with it, it lacks some of the features that uh, Schoology has. And so we were looking something that was for something that was going to be a little bit more robust, that was going to allow teachers to share curriculum seamlessly across the platform, that had a better conferencing tool besides the Google Meet. Um, and had a few more bells and whistles. Um, we're also anticipating that we're gonna be able to replace a couple of softwares that we currently have. We currently use Atlas Rubicon 
uh, for our curriculum management software to house our curriculum. And we're going to be able to, once we get our files transferred over, be able to drop that software and use Schoology to house our curriculum. Uh, we also were looking at picking up um, a parent communication platform, Parent Squared, and Schoology is going to be able to do that too. So it actually was going to save us money to go to this platform. And this is not the way we would typically like to do an adoption because it happened really quickly. We would have rather had a year to do study groups and have teachers piloted and all of these other details. But the reality is we, we are anticipating that we're going to need something next year. And we decided to just um, go for it. We'll do training this summer. Um, teachers that have been using Google Classroom all along are probably going to have a fairly seamless transfer over to the new software. Um, and teachers that were kind of iffy with Google Meet and Google Classroom um, will have a plan to bring them slowly on board uh, to bring them up to speed. Yeah, so my two questions would, would have been the, to provide the, the uh, training for teachers over the summer, but also I think it would be important to do some sort of community outreach to parents, because I think a lot of parents just figured out Google Classroom, and now they're going to have to try to, you know, build that plane all over again. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. I mean, um, that is one of the things that they've been talking about in the technology committee, and um, there was another committee I was sitting in on that was talking about um, providing some um, parent you know, tutorials or something. I mean, in an ideal world, we would have everyone back in school next year, and then we would be able to do some kind of a, a parent training to bring people up to speed. I think that families that have been using the Google Classroom are also going to find that this is a fairly seamless transition. It's supposed to be easier to use than Google Classroom um, as far as keeping track of assignments and, um, and your students' progress and being able to have all your students um, in one place so that you can move in between them as opposed to Google Classroom where you get these kind of streams of um, for each student. Um, so that was one of our main driving points too was we really wanted a, a better communication tool for families um, because Google Classroom just has its limitations in what families can see and access and, and all that. But you're spot on about the training, yeah. Just to interrupt and comment off of that, is it, um, are there going to be changing Google Meet and the uh, email address and everything that Google offers, or is it just really just the classroom portion of it? It's just the learning management system. So our Google at Google um, emails will be the same. Um, the way we store files will be the same. Everything will be the same. It'll just be this learning management piece. So it's essentially replacing Google Classroom and Google Meet, but nothing else. We're keeping the rest of the Google platforms. Yeah, because that would, oh, no, thank you too much. Right. I mean, one of the great things about it is the middle, I mean, the older learners are, they can kind of handle going through one app to the other, but your young, your middle to young, your middle learners from younger grades through middle school, it's all, it's all on one screen. So if you're going to watch a video, you're not leaving one thing to go to another thing, or if you're opening up different applications from a teacher's uh, lesson can be put right in. So you don't have to leave to go searching for another link opening up and that kind of thing. So that's one of the positive sides of it as well. So, and so parents can see it all in one place. You're not trying to, I see how that's, how some of the teachers are using Google, uh, not even outside using Google Docs with all the links in it as their lesson plans and people have to click through the different links, sending them all over different places. This is really brings it into one place. So, um, yeah, as Sarah said, I think we would have rolled it out slower, had we, but this is a tool that we need to give something to help teachers organize um, if we have to go back to remote learning and to, um, you know, it's, it was kind of, it's a rip the bandaid off kind of thing. And I know it's, it, we, we've upset a couple of teachers or a few <laughs> um, because the amount of trying to learn this new, this, another new software, they just learned Google Classroom, they just were forced into using Google Classroom. So now they have to learn something new, but really the benefit, not only cost, but the interface and learning it on the longer picture, we said we're gonna, we're gonna move forward with it and then support them how we can. Good. Uh, George brings up a good point. It dovetails with PowerSchool. So what teachers have had to do in the past is they've had to grade it, the, the Google Classroom will grade an assignment, but then they have to jot down all the scores and put them in PowerSchool. And so this will actually allow the assessments to go right over into PowerSchool and pieces. And they're definitely, I, 
you know, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There will be a learning curve and we are going to have to do some, some really fast pedaling to make sure that, um, you know, everyone gets what they need, families and, um, and faculty. But I think in the long run, we're going to be much, much better off having a tool like this. Darius, you want to you want to keep I'll on keep going? Here. So I guess um, let me just flip over to my calendar here. Um, we're looking at the next school committee meeting. Hey, so this that's our planning process. So we're looking at having our next school committee meeting on July Thursday, July sixteenth. And so I guess I'm looking for Frontier loan so that you have a smaller group to go through this kind of thing to explain the uh, what the plan is with a vote on that plan on the 23rd. Now I throw only a little curveball in there that for some reason, if things get messed up, we may have to move dates and that kind of stuff. But this is how I'm kind of seeing it. If everything goes the way we had planned, um, that way it gives you also a week to digest, um, especially if there's multiple models. Um, it also gives you a chance to ask us a ton of questions and then us coming back and bring answering those questions, much like we do the budget like a single reading it's also like a check-in this is where we're at um and um even at that particular meeting we may have, have more rough draft of models and you may say oh again sarah jump in where you may think it means maybe we show you five models on that on the 16th and you're saying like get rid of one and two we like the last three let's bet those out in the final meeting where we have the final vote something like that sarah do you kind of envision it that way as well yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think a lot of it's going to be dictated by the state. Um, and so there's going to be there may be a clear winner um, that gets presented to the group. And, you know, we can talk about why the other models may have failed. But I also anticipate that there may be more than one model for the year. So we may start out with one model of, OK, we're going to go with this plan. And then the state, and then we shut down and we go remote. So now we're in the remote model. And then we come back and we have, you know, a tighter restriction. So we have to go to model one when that was one that we kind of dismissed in the beginning. So I, I think we're just going to be constantly reacting to what's help happening out there with the health crisis. And, um, you know, we're going to try to set up something that we can carry through and carry through the year. But um, it's just a constantly evolving situation. So I guess the, to fill the <laughs> void there, I guess the, you don't have to vote to have that meeting. You can just, we're just going to schedule the meeting for the 16th. The chair can schedule a meeting. It doesn't have to be agreed upon by the committee to do so, but as long as there's no, um, you know, objections to the plan or any modifications to that plan, we're good to go forward with that. You're going to do a, you're going to do a, um, you're going to send out a doodle ahead of time to make sure we have enough for our quorum. I'm going to, I'm going to, post the meeting, we're going to have the meeting. And um, if we don't have a quorum, I mean, Donna, I know she's listening. She'll try to track you guys down to get an idea if we don't have a quorum that night. But you know, let's let's try to put it on our calendar. So we do. I mean, we got pretty good attendance tonight. And, and if we're, you know, um, we'll figure it out if we don't. Let's deal with that problem. One problem at a time, Bob, I got enough of them. <laughs> well, I just, I just to, and you said something about doing back to back. Are we going to do back to back with uh, Union 38 too? that same night or are we going to do it a yeah i gotta figure out how to do this you know after talking tonight i'm also feeling this initial presentation that i'm not sure i could i could uh have the stamina for back to back so okay. maybe i gotta move them to like the 15th and you guys the 16th because it does take a lot it does there's a lot more back and forth and you know sometimes you you think that the I think the lesson plan is going to be easy and then you get in front of the kids and not the kids i'm for the class and all of a sudden you're like i need to you know i need to rethink that i need to you need more time on this and that kind of stuff because i do want you guys to be able to vet it out and really i think the 16th will be more questions and answers than the 23rd because at least you'll have, that's where we're going to need a lot more time and then the 23rd i think would be a joint meeting because i think people have to vote on it together um but we'll see how that 16th meeting goes okay. you know i'm um, sarah as sarah said there might be a clear this is where all the committees are saying we'd like you to go that direction you see it and you're like yeah that's clearly that's the way we should go you know what about you know some add-ons or you know that kind of stuff and we take it from there i heard you say something about transportation has has anybody talked to lenny at all about the future what it 
could be and how to do it? So transportation is a is a, a, a an issue all in itself. So we're going to get from the state what the maximum number of riders on a bus are. Then we're going to have to look at, we're probably going to have to pull the families and ask them, will they plan on be taking the bus for the first six months of the school year? Because we need to get a number count. And actually, because we do have a lot of families that already drive or drive periodically. And um, basically, we're going to be doing the opposite of what we've been trying to get to happen is get more kids to ride the bus. We're going to try to encourage more kids to get rides in because Right now, the CDC model has like 12 on a bus. Maybe they're going to encourage that, but you know, um, uh, encourage that, increase that rather. Um, you know, we're going to have to do that. And I also have to talk to the bus provider about wiping down buses between runs, and, and and what does that look like? And so, and then depending on the model of what we choose, is it a regular school day, or are we looking to increase transportation? And then that would have to be negotiated out. You know, right now, transportation is an expensive. You know, when we're talking about your models out there, like split day, one group comes in the morning, one group comes in the afternoon, that kind of stuff. I mean, the first thing that comes to those groups' mind is that costs a lot in transportation. And so what would that look like? And so we're going to have to evaluate, really, um, and that's where we're getting feedback from families is going to be important. You're going to have to sign up for bus service. It's not going to be right now. I know a lot of families that it's selective. Some days they drive, some days they don't, you know, and then, you know, that kind of thing is going to be some kind of parameters on that. I, I also think too. I know after school sports have been a reason why the buses seem empty um, a lot of afternoons. Um, but once there's a, you know, whether or not that's going to be happening, do we like that might have a huge impact? So depending on when we ask parents, they'll know or not know, right? Yeah, you know, Olivia, bring up a good point about athletics. I mean, in, in, in athletics, you know, um, an important portion of our school and the other extracurricular activities and what are they going to look like? Um, because right now we don't know because MIA, like the right. state, we're waiting. We're waiting for them to give our feedback. You know, there are some sports that like cross country, you know, I don't see the problem with that other than you could change the start, you know, kind of thing. Um, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. But the problem is how do you bust them to the next meet? You know what I mean? How many can you put on a bus? Do we have to take three buses to take a cross country team to a meet in order to have the proper spacing on a bus? You know, we elicit private transportation, meaning families, you know, it turns into a club sport where we get families and then just those who couldn't secure a ride go on a bus. You know, there's a lot of options there. And then what sports are going to be allowed to go? You know, um, you know, more a heavier contact sport like football, maybe it doesn't. You know, um, part of what I, you know, my, you know, it was someone would listen to me, but I would say you should move. We should move all our non-contact sports to the fall and push football and stuff to the spring. Have baseball and softball in the fall, and have your, you know, have football and lacrosse and wrestling in the spring. You know, but then you have people who, you know, it doesn't work out for everybody that kind of stuff. But you know, those kind of ideas. But I also think we got a lot of athletes and students who want to do more at the end of their school day, and so immediately. Are we going to, you know, provide, if it's not football, are you doing working out after school, you know, and, you know, other goes kind of things where there's social distancing and those other things to get the whole experience. Right now, we're just trying to figure out how we're going to get kids in the classrooms to learn. But those other things are going to come right behind it. And I would say it's a rush right behind it is, well, once you figure that out, what about this, this, and this? And can we have, you know, after school activities and you know, from even things like art club to, you know, those other kind of things. Can we get those things rolling too? Um, because those enrichments, as you all know, um, through many of your own kids' experience, that's what makes school. You know, other than that, we just sit at home and take virtual classes. You know, we there's a reason to come back and we got to make that part of normalcy. I think is also going to be part important for social, emotional of each kid as well. Um, those things that they, um, they do. So, yeah, it's a good question. That's where we're at right there. Um, um, there's no further, further, uh, further discussions of the voted budget. We got two towns have voted the budget so far. We got Conway on, on Saturday and Waitley on Tuesday. If one of the two vote the budget, um, we're okay there. And if right now on the capital improvements, they voted, they both have voted, uh, the first two committees, uh, Deerfield and Sutton both voted for the capital projects. Uh, that 48,000 to take care of the intercom system and the clock have been also been voted thumbs up 
in those other two. The smaller towns, those assessments are much smaller. Um, I think it would be less of a hiccup, but you never know. We might be able to get those through. And I think my kind of promise on that is we're not going to go spending that money until we see what the state comes out with the uh, assessments. So we'll see We'll see where we're going, um, not assessments, uh, how badly the towns are hit, um, you know, with those kind of things. So um, with our other projects that we have lined up. Um, so now we're talking about calendars. So the discussion of Frontier Regional School calendar, like, like, if, like everything else that's up in the air, um, we sent out a draft um, that has school opening on the 27th. I think that's the, that's like the one thing I want the committee to vote tonight is that's the date we're trying to open up school on. So parents have a starting date. Here's the problems is that one, we're gonna need multiple days of professional development for teachers prior to that day. Normally we do one day, two days for new teachers. We do an orientation in the morning, a welcome back celebration, that kind of stuff. The amount of stuff that teachers are gonna have to do before the first day of school, if we're coming back into the building, you're gonna spend half a day just going through the safety protocols of what it is, you know, how the new daily routine works. You're not just running off of institutional history of, you know, everybody knows how first day works because if you've done it so many times, you know, we like boring, you know, um, but we're gonna to have to talk about how kids enter the building, you know, how they're gonna to go to their first class, what happens if a student is sick, what's the protocols there? I mean, a full kind of training from what are the mass protocols, what happens if someone's breaking protocols, you know, all these kind of new things that teachers are gonna learn. So. And Allison's on, so she can jump in, but we had a quick conversation the other day about asking the association to come back on Tuesday and do a Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, we're going to take the November date that we had a full day in service on election day. While I really like that to kind of, you know, there's uh, a day, kind of a day off for election, which is important. I think it should be a national holiday anyways. Um, but until we get there as a nation, um, We'll probably switch that to a half day, make that full day, so we, we can use those as those two full days prior to the start of school year. Okay, here's the curveball. You guys like curveballs because it's not enough on your plate. Is that the state is also talking about possibly shortening the school year by a day or two, or up to three days, to provide more teacher professional development days for this exact <laughs> problem? Because we're not the only district that has this problem. In some districts. Um, have more professional development, so not they're not as worried. But some districts have the same or less, and so like, how are we going to do this with less money, and and so on and so forth um, going into the fall? So, um, so anyways, we're, we're, we're we are agreeing. I think Allison and I are agreeing that you know getting two days before the start of school is good, and if we get another day from the state, we probably sneak that in somewhere into the into the following week or something. So. I think that calendar is going to have to come back to you for approval um, when we have, and also what does the plan look like? So another part of the plan, you know, we're talking about rolling starts, you know, some of the smaller elementary schools drop off may not, may not, may not be that, that big of a deal, but you look at something like Deerfield Elementary, you know, we're talking about 60 kids per grade unloading at once. Imagine first and second graders who haven't left their parents' side in six months that drop-off process can't happen on a normal school day. Like go on in and, you know, that sometimes the parents come in with them and we're gonna have to do some sort of orientation days there. And the same kind of thing trickles all the way up to, to Frontier. You know, what does that look like? How do you get the 110 person seventh grade into the building when they don't know where they're going to keep them separated? So we may have to have a rolling start. You know, maybe we're having certain kids on the first day, certain kids on the second day. We haven't figured that out yet but it affects the school calendar. And so that's part of waiting for, you know, um, I think if we can say this is when the first day of school is when we're gonna come back, waiting on the plans to be brought forth at the July meeting, and then we'll vote the school calendar there at that point as well, because we'll have the guidance from the state, we'll know how many days of uh, professional development they may be squeezing out of the school year and how we wanna situate that in. So again, I'm kicking school calendar another meeting down the road but I think that you can understand there's not much control here. So I'll, so make you wanna... I'll make a motion that the, we, we establish the 27th of August as the starting date of school for the kids. I'll second that. 
Thank you. Uh, before we vote on that, I guess uh, what I want to maybe suggest or clarify, when you talked about rolling starts, uh, what you bring up about the elementary school and the kids being very young and the separation and all that, would it be helpful if for us with Frontier, we had a later start or a staggered start? I mean, I know traditionally we've always kept our school calendars in sync with all of the schools, but maybe for this particular instance, maybe it makes sense to have a different calendar or different start date from the elementary younger school, uh, younger schools. Yeah, I mean, we can we can we can we can uh, talk about that. Um, you know, we, if, as we put together the calendar, we can talk about that. One of the problems we have whenever we split the schedules is that you have some secondary students that are child care providers to the elementary students, and so when they're not, one's going to school and one's not. Um, we, we run into problems, but you know, shifting starting times and that kind of stuff. I know some of the committees are already talking about that. You know, you flip the starting times. You know, doing that kind of stuff. But again, um, I, I don't. There's a part of me. I was talking with the superintendents today about that. We, we do have to keep this. We don't want to try to change too many things because there's already going to be enough changes and new things in place. So I'm just saying that out loud because some of that's going through our planning minds. Is that like it's you know, you'll you'll kiss keep it simple. Um, I what last test was, but keep it simple. Um, you know, you know, really, as we put against this model, you know, we don't want to get every moving part going as well. So, um, yeah, but we'll we'll look at we'll we'll talk about you know whether or not the rolling start and what that looks like. But I think do think orientation days. Maybe there's orientation days where only some of the kids are coming back in the meeting, and it allows parents to help students get the reentry. You know, that kind of stuff. Talking about the younger grades, and then maybe in the secondary, maybe we have. We don't have all the high school coming back. If whatever days the high school are, they're not coming back first. We're having seventh grade first, and maybe seventh and ninth grade start the first day, so that we can use the staff to help coordinate that first day to teach people routines. So that, all that kind of crazy stuff oh, that's part of that planning, that's in that planning thing, right? I think you need to think. No, thank you. Let's get through this meeting before I take one. Um, that also then goes into the school committee schedule. Um, basically, the schedule that you have starting for September. I mean, we'll go we'll go meeting to meeting through the summer. As I said, we're going to get through those planning meetings, but by mid July to late July, hopefully, the state's going to come out with its numbers, and I'm going to start having to have school committee meetings, not just the region but the elementaries, if those numbers affect require school committees to look at the budgets and do some adjustments. So you may have an August meeting for those of you who, who got the beach house for a month in an August. The good news is maybe we'll be able to do it remotely. So you could be, we can see the ocean lapping behind you. Um, but we probably will have to have a meeting in August to talk about if chapter 70 gets hit, we're gonna have to get together as a frontier committee to talk about how we're going to do, what are we gonna shift? How are we gonna you know, come up with the difference? Um, you know, are we going to use reserves? Are we new cutting? You know, that kind of stuff. So, um, just to keep it on our radar. So, that's that's the other. That's where the individual meetings will start to come back, um, probably in in August, September. Um, I basically did the stack schedule again. You know, I think maybe we just we, with lack of better plan, put a plan in place, and then we'll adjust it as we see fit, you know what I mean? I think these remote meetings, they go a little bit longer. So back to back may not be as quick, but um, I think we give it a shot in September. And if it is a disaster, we we come up with a new plan, but at least we have a, a projected plan moving forward um, for school committees next year, um, knowing that we always can call and we always can change. You're not, you're, not, um, you're not married to the schedule. You always have the ability to change. It just keeps everybody allowed to schedule ahead their, their dates. Darius, we got to do a vote first on um, on the motion and seconded on the school starting date a vote. So, Bill? Yes. Bill? Yes. Damien? Yes. Mary? Yes. Keith? No. Judy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Olivia? Yes. Thank you. You could 
Where's what happened to Darius? Where is he? I didn't go anywhere. Okay, now you will right. be back up. Uh, last hey, if I can just uh, if I can just interrupt real quick too. I have about uh, eight minutes before I got to start getting ready for my next flight. Is there anything uh, that we need to vote on that you're going to need my vote for? Uh, it looks like we have a quorum, so I don't. I my vote probably is not necessary, but just want to throw that out. I have to leave in about eight minutes. Um, there is no other vote in regular session that I can see. And if there's something so, in executive, so you session, won't be missed. <laughs> I, can, I'm never missed. <laughs> if there's something important in the executive session, we could pass it on to you, Damien. Okay. Um. Yeah. So the next thing is unfinished business is the evaluation of the superintendent. Um, I got the evaluation out to you less than, I would say, 48 hours ago. So realisticness, I doubt that we have the number um, of evaluations completed for us to review them. So we're going to have to put that on the next agenda. Um, you know, I kind of, you know, it's something I should have had done earlier. I got sidetracked with a lot of other issues that we had going on in our community and with this. And so I apologize for not getting it out sooner. Um, so it, you do all have it to fill out. Um, I know giving the reading for, that I had from you guys at the last meeting, it wasn't the top concern that you had. I still should have got it out a little bit earlier, but I kind of got waylaid by a bunch of other side stuff as you can imagine. Um, so it's out there now. Um, if you fill it out, then the chair can go through it and then we can have a discussion about it at the next meeting. So. Thanks. Next is some new business. I think some of the stuff you probably already talked about, right? Yeah, so we had a, we talked about the planning reopening of school, the school committee resolution. So that was part of the packet. Um, wondering in, um, if you'd be, this was brought forward by uh, um, Jessica Corwin from the uh, Sunderland School Committee. Um, picked this up. I think it may have been gone. You guys may have gotten this from other groups, but basically um, basically a letter to our, our, our leaders of the state that says that, you know, if we're going to open the, this fall in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, it's responsible of each school district to do so safely and responsibly. But basically the, the, the crux of it is that there's an enormous amount of money being asked of schools and it's unfunded, unfunded, man, unfunded mandate. And this is just a letter to go to um, the governor, the secretary of education, the commissioner of education, um, and the Senate and House, the Senate president and House speaker, um, and Joe Comerford and Natalie Blaze, um, just to let them know that, you know, you as a school committee have concerns that they are putting these parameters in place and not giving us funding to go with it. So, um, if I, on that, Darius, just so that you know, Conway's state senator is Adam Hines. Um, and that, um, of of our you know we have a, I think we have a really good legislative uh, team for our area, um, but of all of them, Adam Hines is the only one that is on his respective body's education committee, and Adam Hines is one of only a handful of senators that is on the joint education committee itself. So he is really the one that can actually write something and get it into law um, really quickly. Um, so. So we will add Adam to the list. Yes. Or Senator Hines to the list. Um, uh, At all times. Donna, you, you, can you jot that down, Donna? I know you're listening in. Absolutely. Um, so basically looking to vote um, for you guys to um, ask Bob to sign this letter in behalf of the school committee to send off. You guys have that letter in front of you? Yep. I didn't read it word for word, but. So moved, Mr. Chair. Excuse me? So moved. Second. Bill? Yeah. Phil? Yes. Damien? Yes. Mary? Yes. Keith? Yes. Judy? Yep. Lynn? Yep. Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm, uh, I'm out of here. So have right. a good rest of the meeting. Safe flight. All right. Safe flight. Safe landing.
safe landing. Yeah, <laughs> nice, nice jump, Phil. <laughs> the poor guy's on Nantucket. He doesn't have it that bad. <laughs> um, you know, it's not on the new business, Bob. And I was wondering if I could just add this because I'm sure the school community would be interested. Um, you know, since we put together this agenda, you know, as everyone has been following, there was the murder of George Floyd um, by a police officer and um, the Black Lives Matter movement um, across the country around equity. And there was, I sent out an initial letter um, trying to get the uh, the community to come together as one group and one voice. Um, I did hear a lot of back from community members, positive. And I also heard back that it wasn't enough coming from, from the educational um my role as an educational leader um, in what the schools are doing and myself and the administrative team met multiple times to discuss, uh, you know, what can, what we can do better in that. Um, within that, we sent out another letter um, last week um, outlining our, our the goals that we have moving forward. Um, and in that, we also talked about we created a committee on anti-racism and inequality. Um, really to look at it, and I wanted to do it district wide because we already had things in place moving in Frontier. And I asked Scott Dredge to talk about this in a minute because he's been kind of leading that charge at Frontier. Um, and he's helped, he's, he's a crucial member of putting this committee together to be district wide because some of our schools are so small, it's hard to keep the momentum going and keep a focus going. So I really wanted to think that brings our four communities together, not just the stuff that's working at Frontier, but how we are doing it all the way through the elementaries. I know it's more and more working as one district, but this kind of work is 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 crucial. Mm -hmm. It's also very difficult um, when you have a smaller group, when you're a smaller community, um, it, it's to get the kind of leadership to um, where you should go and how you should go and and getting that that, that um, training as well and, and momentum. So Scott, do you want to talk a little bit about this committee you're putting together or have put together? Sure thing. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the positive things that sprung out from this tragedy and, and, and all that um, the community has been able to talk about with this is we learned that a lot of there was pockets of groups in each school. Um, and for example, you know, at Frontier, we we've been having um, a lot of professional development over the past three years with Sapphire DeYoung from the collaborative. And she's also been, um, you know, an integral part of the discussions we've had through our various groups, we, you know, with our diversity group, I have a peer mentoring social justice group that I've had together for a couple of years. And a lot of the same kids are involved in these groups at Frontier. And likewise, they learned that there's some groups in the elementary uh, level with parents and teachers and, and students. So what we've done is we've, we've combined forces. Um, I reached out to uh, members of the community, parents, um, certainly the students that were involved in my social justice group uh, were included and all the principals, you know, we've generated a large list of, of names. Uh, there's over 30 members now uh, that we have initiated into starting a discussion uh, is really going to be co-chaired and led by uh, Kelsey Crop, who is one of our guidance counselors here at Frontier. And um, myself and uh, we're hoping to get some uh, a parent co-chair and um the goal this summer is going to be to have a couple of forums uh remotely like like we're we're doing now um and, and there's going to be some book discussion and then we really want to hit the ground running at the beginning of the next school year uh with some really pointed efforts um in in the schools k through 12 that we can uh, really target some of the ways um, we're teaching um, and having, uh, you know, open discussions in, in our in our in our curriculum about anti-racism, and and then of course events in the schools too, where we can bring everyone together. Um, but what's really going to be exciting for all of us, I think, is we have a lot of parent movement too, that's really positive in in these <laughs> committees, and um, and we're just incorporating all of it K through 12 uh, from all five schools, and I'm I'm feeling really good about that. Thank you, Scott. So I know, I know. Again, it wasn't on the agenda, but it clearly is, is timely. Scott, is it is this primarily for adults, or uh, do students have a part in it as well? Oh, there's definitely student involvement. Um, right now, the list that we have is is we incorporated the students are involved in our social justice group at Frontier. Um, that was a starting point. Um, really wanted to reach out to um, 
the, the parents and, and teachers who are involved in the elementary level, maybe upper elementary to get some of their student involvement as well. Um, students are definitely the key to this group. Um, so their voice can be um, heard at, at this committee. And then any recommendations that come from the committee will be presented to each school uh, in, in terms of you know, positive change in the school climate and culture and um, anti-racism curriculum. Yeah, I just think that the, the student voice part is really important. Crucial. Couldn't agree with you more. Darius, you want to continue on or is there any other questions for Scott? Thank you. Um, Scott. I guess you're going into reports. Yep. Uh, the only thing I have, I just got a couple quick questions. Is the track on hold? Have we have anything been done with the track yet? So here we are with the track. What we've done is we we are um, we've paid we we hired the designer, the, the architect and designer. They've come out. They've done core samples that basically check what's going on beneath, so they can start doing the design. They're working on that design now. Um, we basically told them that we weren't shooting for the window of this summer or this fall to get it done that we're going to shoot for next year. And um, what we're going to do is, is if we can start the work after July 1 of next year, then our assessment to the town on that project won't come for another 12 months following that. And so I'm trying to get it out of FY22 and put it into FY23 um, to kind of to help that out. So, you know, basically we, we probably, you know, we lost getting the track done again this fall season. It was very unlikely we were going to get it in for the, the winter, uh, the summer season anyways, but and then we pushed it off to the spring. So, um, so if everything goes as it should, we should have track construction or the, the refurbishing of the track um, next summer into fall, depending on when we get the, 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 the contractor lined up. The good news on that is that because we have we have a larger time frame, um, we'll get more bids because the people's bid will be able to be able to start the bidding schedule earlier, which sounds odd, but there's only so many track companies and they line up their schedule for the year. And so we want to get bidding. We want our bid documents to be ready in February for the March bid cycle as they as they as they plan their year out. And then we get on their list of when they're coming through and doing track. So that's where we're at. So in a way, yes, it was put on hold, but um, you know, we lost maybe one season's worth, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I think it's fine for the uh, bed. The, the, the uh, parking lot, we had the plans for the parking lot done. As you know, we got a grant to do the green parking lot there. Um, and so we have right now, we'll, we're going to be submitting for a grant to do the green parking lot, which if we get it, would be close to a million dollars in funding to redo our parking lot in a green in a green manner and be able to do some of the bells and whistles and changing how the traffic flows to a more safe environment. Um, and so and that would be really huge. I'm not sure we're going to see that. I'm, I'm not putting a lot of eggs in that basket right now because I'm not sure how grant, much grants are going to be funded going into this fiscal year, but hope is out there. So um, that's the other kind of thing. The other projects, or the other E&D projects, we put everything else on hold. Um, the ones that we were using E and D from last year on, that the 116,000 you guys approved, we did about half of those. Um, we put those on hold right now because we may be using E and D to help us in the fall if we get hit for the different revenues from the state. If we don't get hit in the different revenues of the state, I'll come back to the committee for you guys to green light the finishing up those projects that you already voted once yes on. Um, but I want to keep the communication here going back and forth because we have to continue to decide how much we want to hold in reserves and how much we, for FY22, after we get through FY21, I'm hoping it's going to be a small bump and we'll be fine. Um, and it's gonna be a decision we make together. Yeah. The other thing I had was um, with what's going on, are we gonna have anybody, any teachers not coming back that we know of right now at Frontier? They're gonna- I'm going to guess, that I, so I, a, um, we have not asked officially yet, that's gonna be in the next few weeks as well. Um, I think, Part of me was even asking families, we're going to send out that initial survey. I heard from other districts that that initial survey is really important within the planning. Um, and we're going to need to do the same thing with faculty. There's a part of me that was like, it was hard to survey families. Are you coming back when they say, I don't know, what are you offering? It's like, 
you know, you're at a restaurant. Do you want the special? I don't know. What are you serving? Oh, we can't tell you that, but are you going to have it? So there's a part of me that's kind of like, it's a little bit of a cart before the horse, but we have to kind of also know, you know, um, get a general idea if, you know, if we had some huge amount of number not coming back, we have to be able to plan effectively to that. The same thing with teachers. So we're going to have to put that survey out in the coming weeks too. George is the, is the chair of the survey committee or the communications committee. So he's listening to us right now. Um, um, so I'm sure he's going, he's jotting that down, but we have to get, we're going to be getting that information as well as we collect the data there. Cause I believe okay. we'll have some teachers that are, that may be unable to come back and there's different ways of phrasing it, you know, um, the, due to either, you know, current medical conditions or previous medical conditions. And, um, you know, I met with them, um, in their union and talked about, you know, we're going to try to find a place for them, but depending on the numbers, um, we may also have to look to, you know, you may have to take the other legal options that they can take um, right. if they can't return to work. So difficult spot as an employer, I can say for the most. Yeah. Right there. Lynn, do you have any collaborative that you want to share? Um, no, a lot of the talk at our last meeting was about finances and everything that's being cut, but I do have a list of professional development opportunities for teachers. Uh, Darius, I don't know if you also get that kind of email. If you don't, then I will forward it to you, and then you can forward it to the teachers in some way. I usually get them, so okay. I, I can forward that, and usually I forward those along as well. So okay, good. Um, yep. Thanks, Lynn. No problem. Uh, George, what do you have for us? Yeah, you. Um... Uh, at this point, um, Bob, I've got nothing to add. I think I think everything has pretty much been covered. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is the the fact that we've got the district level committees. Uh, we've got um, we're going to have building based committees as well. Uh, that are sort of working tangentially to what's happening at the at the district level. Uh, the curriculum committee has already been meeting uh, with Sarah and with a number of our staff, and Scott and I are going to be meeting with a number of people uh, beginning uh, the week of July 6th as well, uh, just to sort of help coordinate the planning that's happening at the district level. So okay. at this point, that's the only thing I would probably have to add. I think Darius and Scott and Sarah have pretty much have covered everything. Okay, thank you. Darius, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I like to say George made a good point that this committee work that they're doing, they're doing the oversight and then each building is going to have to get their work teams in place and how they're going to execute each one of these things in all five buildings. So it was a good, good reminder. Thank you, George. Okay, we need a, um, I don't think if we have anything else, we're going to be going in, into executive session. So we're going to, so we're going to make a motion and somebody's in a second to go out of this one. And then we're going to go over and go into executive session. Is Does George need to come into this one, Darius? Uh, actually, yeah, no, George and Scott should not come to this one. Okay. Um, everybody else, Missy, you can because you're, 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 you're with us now. So, um, so I need a motion and a second to come, get out of this meeting. So move, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. And roll call, Bill. Yes. Phil? Yes. Mary? Yes. Keith? Yes. Judy? Yep. Lynn? Yes. Missy? Yes. And Olivia? Yes. Okay, guys, we'll see you in the executive session. <laughs>